Now, if you are visiting, we are in the middle of a, uh, or actually we're just at the beginning, front end I should say, of a series that we're doing called Route 66. And if you haven't been with us before and wondering what the deal is with all of this, you know, stuff behind us and uh, sort of the way that the uh, sanctuary looks, it has to do with uh, this series that we've started. And, uh, and what we're doing is simply every week, except for today, uh, we are going to be going through one book uh, of the Bible. There's 66 books, if you aren't familiar with that. And it's like a journey that we're taking. And in order just sort of to have some fun with it and as a way to remember some things, we're, we're also going through Route 66, uh, the physical Route 66, as we go along the way through the books of the Bible. And what I want to do this morning um, is I want to do something just a little bit different and that is, uh, imagine, and for those of us that have, uh, you know, been on the journey now uh, for the last five weeks, imagine, we, you know, we finished the first leg of this trip, which corresponds to the state of Illinois, and, and currently uh, on that part of Route 66, we're sitting on the east bank of the Mississippi River, getting ready next week to cross over into St. Louis and the state of Missouri, uh, and we're going to make 12 stops along the road there in Missouri that will correspond with the next 12 books of the Old Testament. But what I was thinking I might do this morning, real briefly, is take you through the whole journey uh, to give you sort of a framework uh, of these individual stops we're making. It's almost like, and I, I don't know if you're like me, I'm kind of a map guy. I, I, you know, if I'm on a trip... Uh, I really like kind of pulling the map out and seeing where I am and, you know, what's going on. And particularly if it's a long trip, kind of, you know, looking at, well, here we're here and here's where we have to go. And, and so this morning's going to be a little bit like that. We're actually, and by, oh, this is the east bank of the uh, Mississippi River, by the way, Chain of Rocks Bridge. We'll talk a little bit more about that next week. Um, and what I want you to do this morning is I really want you to take notes. So hopefully you have something to take notes with. But in your bulletin, there's a blank sheet there that's for, for taking notes. And what I'd like you to do is, uh, is, is write down just the side, like a column there in your notes, write down th this leg one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Because we're going to go through the eight legs of the trip. And part of what I want to do this morning is I'm going to give you a word uh, for each of these legs that is uh, sort of a, the theme of that overall section uh, of the Bible. And, and honestly, if you can uh, memorize and remember these eight words, you could sit down anytime and kind of talk your way through uh, exactly how the Bible fits together and what is in every section of it. So uh, this should be something that's quite helpful to you in terms of, again, having the big uh, picture. So eight legs, and, uh, and we're going to go through those this morning. Obviously, this first leg uh, we've actually, um, let me see if I got it here, there we go. Uh, again, we've just finished the first leg, so we've made five stops, we've made it through uh, the, the state of Illinois, and the key word here is this word, which we've talked about before, law. So those first five books of the Bible, when you think about that first leg, they constitute the Torah, which is Hebrew for the word law, and the law of Israel is contained in there. Also on that first leg, I should just point out that, um, you know, take you back for one second to what is the uh, sort of the interpretive key to all the rest of the Bible in a sense, because in Genesis chapter 12, remember, what's happened in those first 11 chapters is we've been told basically that something is radically wrong with the world, that nothing is the way that it ought to be, and that's all a consequence of the fall and what happens in those first 11 chapters. And when we hit chapter 12, this is where God makes a promise to Abraham and launches this plan to bring everything back to the way it ought to be. And actually, even this morning, I'll give you a little hint, beyond, far beyond what we lost there in the beginning. And so th this is what we read in chapter 12. The Lord said to Abraham, go from your country, your people, your father's household to the land that I will show you. And I'll make you into a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great. And you will be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. 
And so the plan is set in motion, and what we see then is that, that this first leg of the trip, these are the first five books of the Old Testament, and, and part of what I want to do this morning is give you a little bit of a time frame. And so from Genesis chapter 12, we really have a hard time dating anything prior to that, but Genesis 12, the call of Abraham, we know roughly took place around 2000 B.C., and over the last few weeks, as we've gone through these first five books, we now, as we're getting ready to uh, enter leg two and jump into the book of Joshua, we're right about 1400 BC. And so this first stretch here, uh, leg chapter one, covers the 600 years between 2000 BC, 1400 BC. Gotten to the end of that, leg two, then we're now ready to, uh, to enter into Missouri. It's gonna be 12 stops in Missouri, as I said, and by the way, we're gonna have fun with this. Um, uh, St. Louis particularly, it's kind of a fun town. We're gonna to have some fun with St. Louis. I'll, uh, I'm gonna show you some stuff. You'll, oh, I don't wanna, I, I, I won't tip you off. I won't spoil it, anyway. It's just going to be really cool. You really should be here. I mean, this is like, oh, I'm just going to be amazing. No, anyway. All right. So there's, there, there's actually 12 stops as we go through Missouri. And the key word here is history. So what we're going to be looking at here in leg two uh, is that we're going to be looking at the history of Israel. So 12 books that are going to cover that. And, and, and these 12 uh, books will begin when, from the time that they enter the promised land. And, and they're going to take us all the way through the history of Israel uh, through their captivity and the return from captivity and the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem and historically actually to the end of the Old Testament. So we have a lot of ground that we're going to cover in this next leg of the trip and these are the books that we'll be going through. And again, when we, when we look at uh, the, the span of time that's covered here uh, from roughly around 1400 BC all the way up to roughly 400 BC and think about that for a second because when you read the Bible, I think a lot of times we, we don't uh, get a sense of, you know, how lengthy some of these time periods are. And I was thinking, I, I tried to think back. I mean, that would be like us looking at uh, our history from 1016 A.D., all the way to 2016 AD. And, you know, I went back and was trying to figure out what, what happened in 1016. And when you think about it, I mean, you know, William the Conqueror hadn't even conquered England yet. Uh, Magna Carta hadn't been written. I mean, a thousand years is an amazing length of time. And we're going to be covering that much time uh, in the history of Israel in that second leg of the journey. And so history History is the key here, and uh, again, uh, it, that's going to be a fun uh, series that we go through there because of the fact that there's so much story and narrative there. Now note, when we get through this leg uh, of the trip, uh, up to this point, things have been chronological. So when you begin in Genesis, other than uh, Leviticus and Deuteronomy, which don't exactly move the storyline forward, but everything that you read from uh, the book of Genesis up through Esther, uh, it's all a chronological history, which makes a lot of sense and actually kind of helps us understand. But your Bible is not put together chronologically. And so what happens is that when we get to the next leg of the trip, the chronology is going to change. So it's not like you read Esther and then the next book you, you pick up, which is Job, is going to move you further down the line in Israel's history. And so that third leg of the trip, uh, which will take us through Kansas, uh, it is going to have five stops. Now we're going to have to really be creative with these five stops because Route 66 only goes through 12 miles of Kansas. And so like we're going to be stopping, you know, at every fire hydrant along the way, you know, I mean, it's, you know, we'll, we'll figure something out, but we'll have fun. But the books are really cool because the key word here on, on these books is that uh, the, these are the books that are referred to as Old Testament poetry. And what happens when you hit this little section of your Old Testament is that now all five of those books fit back under chronologically something that went on in the history 
part of your Bible. And so they aren't chronological. Most of these actually, uh, although there's a few pieces of this that date all the way back to Moses, so that would go clear back to 1400 BC, but most of, of these books uh, begin right around the time of King David. And uh, obviously the, the books that are involved here, uh, Psalms, we oftentimes identify with David, although he didn't write all of them. He wrote about half of the Psalms though. And then his son, Solomon uh, is credited with writing both Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. We really don't know who wrote Job, and frankly, we don't know uh, timing-wise where it fits into the chronology, but, but roughly what we're talking about is a shorter period of time here, around 1000 uh, BC and uh, up probably only till about 900 BC uh, as we look at these five books, but important books, obviously, and again, poetry is a key word. So first five books, you got law. Next 12 books, you have uh, history. Next five books, you have poetry. And then we hit uh, the next leg of the journey, and that leg is going to take us then uh, into Oklahoma. And Oklahoma is going to have 17 stops while we go through uh, the state of Oklahoma. And the key word here uh, in Oklahoma is the word prophets. And when we get to this leg of the journey, uh, we're going to be looking at 17 books uh, of the Old Testament that contain the works of all of the prophets of Israel. And again, the prophets are not chronological. As a matter of fact, they aren't even set up within the section of your Bible chronologically. Uh, what we have, and I could have split these into two sections, but we didn't need to, but, but you have the first five uh, books of prophecy in the Old Testament. They're referred to as the major prophets. And the reason, really, simply that they're referred to, although Lamentations doesn't quite fit this way, but Lamentations is set in there for a particular reason following Jeremiah. We'll talk about it when we get there. But they're called the major prophets simply because they are the longest books of the prophets. Some of the prophets are very short. You know, one, two, three, three little chapters, and you know, I haven't even figured out how we're going to expand out to fill the whole hour on some of these, but the major prophets are very difficult. Isaiah has 66 chapters, and so again, we have the major prophets and the minor prophets, but these, like the poetry, all of these fit back under the history of the nation of Israel. And they really begin about the time uh, when the nation, uh, after Solomon's son, Rehoboam, uh, takes the throne after Solomon, uh, the nation of Israel has a civil war. And you cannot understand the Old Testament if you don't understand what happens at this point in time. Because uh, after Solomon, there no longer is a unified nation of Israel. There is a civil war and the country splits in two. Uh, ten tribes rebel against the, the throne there uh, in Jerusalem and become an independent uh, nation that becomes known as Israel. And so again, when you're starting to read in the prophets, and the prophet talks about a specific king or talks about Israel, it, it helps to know, okay, wait a minute, this is being addressed to that northern kingdom. The southern kingdom then became known as Judah. And in 722 BC, the Assyrian Empire came in and annihilated the northern kingdom. And those 10 tribes that made up what, we, what would be called Israel at this point in time, the, nobody knows what happened to them. Uh, they're literally called the lost tribes of Israel. Israel. 
And there are all kinds of speculation about what happened to these, uh, you know, all the way from that they just kind of basically ceased to exist to where did these people go? Where did they end up? You know, where are their descendants? And again, there, there are theories that uh, have them traveling up into Britain uh, and that uh, anybody that is of English descent actually could trace their descent back to one of the lost tribes of Israel. Others that saying they went down into Ethiopia and, and there's people then that, again, can identify, well, what tribes were they that went to Ethiopia? But the fact of the matter is that we just don't know. And many of you in this room could be descendants of those 10 tribes of Israel. And when that happens, then now there's only one kingdom left, which is the southern kingdom. And from 722 BC, that kingdom uh, will exist till 586 BC. And in 586 BC, that kingdom is going to be destroyed by the Babylonians. But the Babylonians had a different way of dealing with a conquered people than the Assyrians did. The Assyrians uh, intentionally set out to destroy the identity of the nations that they conquered. And that's why we don't have these 10 tribes. They forced intermarriage. They would take people and ship them all over their empire from wherever uh, that they, uh, you know, where they, ever they you know, had come from, intentionally to destroy the identity. But the Babylonians had a different way of dealing with a conquered people. Part of what they did was they left some people right in place but they took the cream of the crop and the leadership and they took them over to Babylon and there they uh, indoctrinated them with the, the belief systems and their identity trying to create this leadership that would now become Babylonian and when they went back then to those that were left behind that there would be, they would become an ally of the Babylonian Empire. And so in 586 BC they conquered Jerusalem, they destroy Jerusalem, they destroy the temple, they destroy the walls of the city and the cream of the crop gets carried away. Uh, two of of those that get carried away are named Daniel and Ezekiel. And so again, when you're reading uh, the prophecies of Daniel and Ezekiel, historically we know that that goes back to that period in history when Jerusalem was destroyed. And then at the end of 70 years, as was prophesied, by the way, by Jeremiah, that this captivity would last 70 years, at the end of 70 years, a remnant of the, of the captives there in Babylon, uh, get permission and go back to begin rebuilding Jerusalem, and specifically the first wave go back to rebuild the temple. And so we'll we'll look at that history as we go on. And then that's around five. Uh, that's around 516 or so uh, when, when they head back to rebuild the temple. But it's still, the city still lies devastated. And so in 445 BC, uh, we're, we're told that, that the, uh, the, that the uh, Assyrian emperor Artaxerxes, his cupbearer comes in to him, his name's Nehemiah, and he's sad. If you're the cupbearer to the king, your whole job is to put on a happy face and try and make the king happy. And so if you come in to see the king and you're sad, you're not only likely to lose your job, it's quite possible you're going to lose your life. And so the king Artaxerxes, he, you know, he, asks, uh, he asks Nehemiah, well, what's, what's wrong? Why are you sad? And Nehemiah kind of, you know, really, this is a gutsy thing that Nehemiah does. He says, well, why shouldn't I be sad when the city that I love is in ruins? And out of that, Nehemiah then gets sent back with a second wave, and their job is to rebuild the walls of the city of Jerusalem. And it's not until those walls have been rebuilt that, uh, that, that Jerusalem really becomes a city again. And during that period of time, there'll be prophets that come and speak to what's going on at this time of the restoration. And, and really, by the time that we get to the end of the prophets, we come to the end of the Old Testament right around roughly 400 B.C. Now, the next leg of our journey after that is going to then take us into the New Testament and on our Route 66 uh, passage, we're going to be going through the state of Texas. And there's going to be four stops in Texas, but let me, let me just pause for a minute because I, I have the time to do it. 
Um, we have in what we refer to in the Protestant world as the 400 silent years. So 400 years between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. If you grew up um, Catholic, your Bible has a whole section that drops into this period of time between 400 B.C. and the beginning of the New Testament, and those books are referred to as the Apocrypha. And uh, the Catholics uh, embraced the Apocrypha and made it part of their Bible. They didn't do it till quite late in their history, by the way. This didn't take place early in church history. It took place later. And it's fascinating because, uh, you know, I've, I've explained to you before a little bit about how the Hebrew Old Testament, uh, uh, the, the Jewish Old Testament was written in Hebrew. And after Alexander the Great basically conquered the world, he set out to what, what historians will refer to as he set out to Hellenize the known world, which means he not only wanted to rule over the known world, he wanted to infuse Greek culture and values into the known world. And part of what they did is they tried to spread the Greek language to the whole known world so that there would be one language that everyone that was part of, of the empire of Alexander the Great could speak Greek. Well, what happened is that some Jews uh, ended up not knowing Hebrew. And, and consequently, they couldn't even read what we would consider their Bible, the Tanakh, they couldn't read it because it was in Hebrew. And what happened is, is that a group of scholars, 70 Jewish scholars, went to Alexandria in Egypt, which was one of the academic centers of the ancient world. They went there and the tradition is that they, they came to Alexandria to translate uh, the, the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek so that anyone that spoke Greek that was Jewish or non-Jewish could now read what we think of as the Old Testament. And the tradition is that it took 70 scholars 70 days to translate that, and consequently it became known as the Septuagint, which is a word that obviously comes from the word for 70. Interestingly enough, the Septuagint included some of these books. So, fascinatingly, the, 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 the Jewish people, when they put together their scriptures, a process that's known as uh, putting together the canon, meaning those books that are authoritative, the Jewish people didn't use the books of the Septuagint. They used the 39 books of what is, exists as our Protestant uh, Old Testament. And at the time of Jesus, th there's no reference to those books, maybe, maybe not by Jesus at least, one little reference to the book of Enoch in one of the letters that are written later on. But it would appear that, you know, that what the, the Bible that Jesus embraced was that Hebrew version. But now you have this Greek version and you have, you know, this set of books. Uh, part of what happens around this time, by the way, is that, uh, well, it's a little bit later when we get into the New Testament times, is that um, you, they didn't have a New Testament. You know, the, these, these letters and these Gospels, first of all, nothing was written, probably, till around 50 A.D. So Jesus is resurrected in 33 A.D. And the message of, of Christ really was transmitted orally uh, from about 33, probably up to around 50. And, and part of that, I think, is that, again, in their culture, um, oral transmission was considered to be more reliable than a written document. Very hard for us to get our mind around that because we are so you know, locked into you know, written documents. But, but the fear was uh, that, that a, a written document could become distorted. And, and, and the truth would get changed, whereas the way that you learned oral tradition, I mean, it was a, you know, a word by word, letter by letter transmission of what you had been taught. So the story of Jesus, you know, in the early years of the church um, was transmitted that way. But when Jesus didn't return with immediacy, because the early church really thought he was coming back quickly, it suddenly began to dawn on them, wait a minute, you know, if we begin to die off, how is this story going to continue 
to be communicated. And what happened is, is that then the, the, the story of Jesus began to be written down in what we now call our Gospels. And three of those, uh, probably written between 50 and 70 AD, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, they're, they're very similar. Uh, scholars either argue that the, you know, the earliest version uh, perhaps was Mark, perhaps written around 50 AD, um, and that maybe Luke and Matthew actually uh, used Mark in their translations because they're, you know, they're telling basically the same story, a little bit different perspectives. And, um, it, and then by the end of the first century, John and again, speculatively, let's say, looking at what had been written, the four Gospels, um, realizes that there were some great moments in the life of Jesus that hadn't been included because they aren't comprehensive. They're, they're written to kind of tell the big story, but it doesn't mean that every single thing that Jesus did are, are in those early Gospels. And so John, probably around 90 AD, he, he writes... Uh, the Gospel of John. And by the way, key word, obviously, during this leg of the trip is the word Gospels. And, uh, and John writes his book almost as supplementary to the other three. The first three, which are, there's a technical term called synoptics, and, and the word means to see together. And, and, and it's a word that is saying that these first three Gospels tend to cover a lot of the same material. As a matter of fact, um, the, the number that I've heard is that 90% of the content in those first three Gospels is shared uh, among the three, and that in the individual Gospels, there's only 10% of the content that's different than what's in the other two. And, but John's Gospel, 90% of John's Gospel is new. It's not contained in those first three. So, so you really need to put those together to get the whole picture of Jesus. By the time the church is beginning to gather these things and the criteria for putting together what we would now call the New Testament was that the document was apostolic and that it had been used in the ministry and worship of the church through the first century and that it was authentic and known to be written by an apostle. Now, why? Well, because by the third century, there were a lot of heresies that had already begun to float around the Christian church. Um, you know, I, they weren't extensive, and some people would lead you to believe that, oh, this was a battle, and it was 50-50, and half of these got thrown out. Uh, you know, when you hear that, you know, you'll, you'll hear people say, oh, well, the church decided what books, you know, uh, and, and the reason they decided it was th those things that would uh, justify what they believed, but they threw out all of these books that should have been in there. Well, it, it's really bunk, that particular uh, way of thinking, because most of what got written later Oftentimes, and so you'll see things like the Gospel of Thomas. Uh, a couple of years ago, the big one, cover of Time magazine, the Gospel of Judas. And the Gospel of Judas, you know, claimed uh, in the document, it claims to be written by Judas. And basically what it says is that Judas wasn't a bad guy. Judas, he was the good guy, and that he and Jesus came up with this whole plot, you know, and, uh, and that, uh, you know, that... His, you know, handing Jesus over was something that Jesus decided. I mean, it, it, it just gets bizarre. And a lot of strange theology began to enter in, too. So, uh, you know, in the, uh, the Gospel of Thomas, for instance, um, it, it was, and you've heard me say a little bit about this before, but it, it was uh, in the document, it's saying that Thomas is teaching what Jesus taught and what is contained in there uh, is a form of what was called Gnosticism. And Gnosticism was a Greek philosophy that really constantly seemed to cause problems for the early church because the Gnostics believed that spirit was good and matter was evil. And they even, and you've heard me say this, I'll just repeat it, but they even taught that there was a, there was a pantheon of gods, uh, there was one true God in whom all of the fullness of deity dwelled, and then there were emanations that came out from the one true God that were basically lesser deities, but the further away they got from the one true God, the more off base they began to get until finally one of those emanations was so far off from the one true God that he made a huge mistake and he created the world. <laughs> 
and that is the God of the Old Testament. And, and so, you know, so documents were being written that were, that were propagating that concept, and they were, they were written second, third century, but they, were, they, were, they, were, they came out under the name of first century apostles, and they became known, you don't need to remember all as pseudepigrapha, which means a false signing. And it, it wasn't Judas. You know, we know that that particular document was written in the third century uh, by a Gnostic trying to give credibility to this. So, uh, so you have these books that aren't in, uh, in the Bible, and, and it's helpful sometimes to know why they aren't and what went on, uh, again, to make sure that what you and I have in our Bible is, are the same Bible that the early church used with the documents that were written either by the apostles or by their representatives. Uh, so again, even by 177 AD, I mean, this is like within 70 years of the end of the first century, uh, one of the early church fathers, uh, Irenaeus, wrote and specifically said, uh, it's a great little quote, that Mark, uh, Mark wrote uh, his gospel under the direction of Peter. So the reason Mark had credibility is it was considered Peter's gospel. Matthew, obviously, one of the apostles. John, obviously, one of the apostles. Luke, the traveling companion of Paul. And as early, again, as 177, the reference is made that Luke wrote the gospel that Paul had communicated to him. So, so these were the four, uh, the four documents of the life of Christ that were considered authentic and inspired and authoritative quite early in church history. So that leg of the journey, uh, the Gospels, uh, we'll, we will be going through those with, with four stops. All right, now, moving on. Uh, the next leg, oh, there we are. And again, time-wise, time-wise, we're looking at, uh, unless you include John, which begins in eternity past, uh, but let's just say historically, uh, particularly in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the earliest of those Gospels begins, of course, with the birth of Christ uh, and, and goes to around 33 AD uh, with the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus. So it's a, a relatively short period of time covered there in those Gospels, and most of it covering 30 AD to 33 AD, roughly. All right, uh, next leg of the journey... Whoa, oh, I was gonna show you this too. Um, the Gospels now, part of what happens when we hit the Gospels is that out of the Gospels and the story of Jesus, the life and teaching of Jesus, the death and resurrection of Jesus, and the significance of that, of course, becomes sort of the central piece of the whole journey. I mean, that's at the heart of everything in the Bible is the life, death, resurrection of Jesus there in the Gospels, but part of what we see there in the life of Christ and what he accomplished is a fulfillment going back to the promise of Genesis chapter 3. So for instance, in the third verse there of Genesis, um, Genesis chapter 12, in the third verse of this covenant that God makes with Abraham, notice that he says that all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Well, it's not till the New Testament is written that we understand that that's really a promise of the coming of Messiah and all that the Messiah would accomplish so that the whole earth was going to be blessed through the coming of Messiah. And Paul actually very clearly writes about this in Galatians, and he makes this statement, just one of many in Galatians. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. So what Paul is saying is the whole experience of what Jesus accomplished and what happens when we open our lives to Jesus and the Spirit of God comes and dwells in us and brings us new life and we become alive again, that's you know, a critical part of what was lost in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. And so when God makes the covenant, he's, you know, he's saying that there is a day coming when the whole world is going to be blessed through you and your descendants, and it gets fulfilled partially at the time of the Gospels. I'm going to suggest to you that it doesn't fully get fulfilled until the book of Revelation and the last two chapters of Revelation uh, specifically. So, Anyway, here we go. Next uh, leg on the journey. And uh, 
after the Gospels now, uh, and after Texas, uh, we're going to head into New Mexico. And uh, the key word here in New Mexico is quite simple. It's Acts. And we're only going to make one stop on this leg of the trip because Acts sort of stands uh, alone and by itself. And we'll, we'll probably hang out in Albuquerque since that's where Allison was born. And we'll, you know, like I'll show you her house growing up and, you know, and her, her no, anyway, we'll, we'll have some fun. Albuquerque's kind of cool because Route 66 went right down Central Avenue, right through the middle of Albuquerque. And you can go there today and there's, you know, you can see all kinds of old Route 66 stuff, but Acts. So Acts is simply the story of the early church. So again, now chronologically, We've kicked back into gear, so the Gospels tell the history of Jesus, and they're chronological, and now the book of Acts picks up with the ascension of Christ right around 33 AD, and, and it's going to take us all the way till around 60 AD, which is about Paul is in prison in Rome, and, uh, and the book of Acts comes to a close because it was probably written right around there. There's still, you know, there's still this piece of church history that's going on. Uh, the next, you know, the next uh, you know, historical document that has any part of the narrative really doesn't come till John writes Revelation in around 95 AD. So you, you've got sort of a gap in here in terms of the chronology. But what happens now, uh, after we get through the book of Acts, uh, and we get into uh, the next leg of the trip, which would be Arizona, is that Arizona now has 21 stops. So we're gonna spend a lot of time in Arizona. And we'll be doing it in the winter, so it'll be really great. Uh, you know, it's just a little joke, you know, kind of feel warm. I don't know, maybe we'll do some fake, you know, sunlights in here or something. Anyway, uh, 21 stops in Arizona, and the key word there uh, in this leg of the journey is epistles, which really means letters. So if it's easier for you to remember letters, memorize that. But these are the 21 epistles that are written uh, by leaders in the early church instructing believers how do you live the Christian life. And, and there are 21 of those documents contained in your New Testament. On the left-hand side here are the ones that Paul uh, is responsible for writing. So out of those 21, 13 of those were written by the Apostle Paul, and they're called the Pauline epistles. And then eight were written by others, including James, the brother of Jesus, Peter, uh, John writes three short letters, Jude, who we believe is also another brother of Jesus, Hebrews, nobody really knows who wrote it. They're called the general epistles. But what they do is they, most of them fit back under the book of Acts. And so as Paul is on his journeys, what would happen, and again, as it's contained in Acts, we aren't told when he writes, but what we do know is that things happened on, in the book of Acts that then stimulated Paul or one of the others to write a letter to address it. And so generally speaking, the, the letters span this period of time from around 50 AD, we think, probably the earliest, which uh, probably was either James uh, or um, uh, Galatians. There's a lot of debate because we don't exactly know, but, but that's what sort of the consensus is. But it, so these all fit back under, some of them fit under the book of Acts, others of them would chronologically fit in that period of time, up roughly till around 63 or 70 in some senses, because uh, right in the mid-60s is when Paul and Peter are both uh, martyred in Rome and put to death, and so their letters had all been written prior to that, but there, there are a few that could have been a little bit later. So, but we, that's going to be a long, long time that it's going to take us to go through 21 stops in Arizona, and then that brings us to the final leg of our trip, which is California. And California only has one stop. And we'll make it all the way down there on the pier on Santa Monica. If you've ever been to Santa Monica, you can go to the end of the pier and there's actually a plaque there that says, end of Route 66. And if you go any further, you get very wet. So, you know, so right over the side there. But, but the final, book, final leg of the trip, one stop and uh, the key word there is, of course, Revelation. And it's then the final book uh, of our journey. Uh, 
The first three chapters really targeted uh, at around, uh, uh, around what's happening in 95 AD because they're written to first century churches. And then beginning in chapter four, the next 19 chapters of the book lay out for us the future of the world. And in the final two chapters of the book, what we see there is the new heavens, the new earth, uh, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, and we are given just a glimpse of what happens when the old order passes away and the new age begins. And, and I think, and when we get there, I'll go into more detail on this. Some of you have heard me say this before. I think those are the two most important chapters, maybe in all the Bible, because what they show you is that it's faulty thinking to believe that what happened is God made everything good and then we fouled the whole deal up and we lived in this period of history where nothing is the way it should be, but one day Jesus Christ is coming again, which is the big message, of course, of Revelation. And when Jesus Christ comes, he's going to fix things so it'll be just like it was in the beginning. Nothing could be further from the truth, by the way. Because if that's the case, why in the world did God allow all of the junk that has gone on since Genesis chapter 3 all the way through the time that Christ comes? Because the world is nuts. And, 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 and something, if there's not some reason for all of this, it just doesn't make sense. And what I think the final chapters of Genesis tell us is this, is that where this whole story is going is to an ending that is infinitely greater than what the story would have been had the fall never taken place. And that what we can look forward to in the age to come and in this incredible relationship that we'll have with God in a new heavens, in a new earth, and everything that goes into that is infinitely greater and that God has used the fall and everything that's transpired in human history all leading up to that beginning of a new age in which things will be infinitely greater even than what he created at the beginning of Genesis. So we make it through Revelation. It ends with not only everything being fixed, but infinitely better. And you put it all together and you've got Route 66, 66 books of the Old and New Testament, the whole plans and purposes of God laid out and having kind of looked at the big picture, we fold the map back up. We're now ready, eight legs. Again, memorize this, guys, it'll be helpful. And uh, we're now, we're ready to cross the Mississippi and we're ready to cross the Jordan and next week we'll hit the book of Joshua. Let's pray. Lord, your, uh, your plans are marvelous. And uh, it's all there, Lord. You just laid the whole thing out for us. And I know that uh, often perhaps we find the Bible hard and confusing and just, you know, you know, too much to digest. But the reality is that it all fits together so perfectly. Just the unfolding of your immense love for us. And uh, even in our freedom, having chosen rebellion and, and death coming into the world and sickness and struggling and pain and suffering and all that came with the fall, that, that you loved us so much that, that really from the time of Abraham, you, you, you launched the plan. And Lord Jesus, when you came, that you came to fulfill that promise that, that again we could be returned to relationship with God and experience blessing and new life in the Spirit. And that wasn't even the end, that all that you accomplished there to fulfill it ultimately will be fulfilled when you return again. This afternoon would be great, Lord. We would really like it if you came this afternoon. But whenever it is, Christ, that, uh, that you have a future plan for us that is beyond our ability to even imagine. And Lord, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.